that are my guests. We have it on the big screen. I hope we can read it. I put it in blue because I just figured, no, it wasn't that a problem. It's just blue. <laughs> okay, let's just read this. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and, and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Turn to your neighbor and say, great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for today. Father, in spite of everything that has gone on this week, Lord Jesus, we stand on your promises. You are everything to us. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You are our Savior. And without you, we are nothing. And Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, as you teach us your ways. Teach us how to be persistent in everything, Lord Jesus, that you ask us to be. Father, sometimes in this life, we will encounter great obstacles. We will encounter great trials. Let us be people of persistence. Let us be people, Lord Jesus, that lean solely on you the author and perfecter of our faith. So, Father, I pray as you hide me behind your precious cross this morning, and again, as you teach us your many truths, in the mighty name of Jesus, that everybody says, Amen. Amen. Again, as we take a look at this text, um, Jesus somehow ventured away from what we would call what was customary to him, going to the people or the children of God. And in fact, Jesus, in verse 21, he says, leaving that place, Jesus actually went away from the, the Jewish communities and actually went to, as you can see, this woman who was a Canaanite. Jesus ventured to a place where there were more Gentiles than there were Israelites. And so, was this something that Jesus knew? Of course, we know that God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. We know that God knew that the woman of the well was going to be there at a certain hour. And I also believe that God is trying to teach us something through this Canaanite woman and how she had a need. And his disciples are here with him. And this is the great thing about God. And, and as we, as a people of God, we, many of us have followed Jesus for a number of years. And in our following with Jesus, there has been times of great understanding, and then there have been times where God just doesn't make sense. And the thing is, is we learn in this, in this text where Jesus has an audience, and most of the audience is Gentiles. But his disciples are there, and his disciples need to learn something about compassion on people that are not of their kind. Let me say that again. The disciples need to learn to have compassion on people that are not of their kind. He is trying to impart his truths and the way he lives to the people that he's going to leave a legacy with. And so he is in a land or in a region where they are not familiar with. And a woman of, of the Canaanites were, they were unbelievers. In fact, I used to tell my youth group way back in the day, whatever you do, don't fall in love with a Canaanite. Okay? In other words, always look for people of God. Okay? Don't be unequally yoked. Okay? So the thing is, is here was this Canaanite woman, and of course she had a need. 
And because of this great need, she heard, and this is the great thing about God. God was performing all these miracles. These miracles were, I mean, epic. Healing the, the, the lame and giving sight to the blind, casting out demons. Jesus was doing a plethora of all kinds of things in, in the midst of his people. Somehow, some way, the miraculous got word to the Gentiles. And as Jesus, his following, if you will, came to this woman, she heard everything that any woman of desperation would want to hear. And this was a great opportunity for this woman because she heard that Jesus, the Messiah, was in her region. Her, her daughter was demon-possessed. She probably tried everything, everything that we could even think about. And when you think about a mom's uh, desire to want to take away the pains of her children, when you think about a mom's desire who cares so much for her child, I bet the mom would wish that that, that demon possession would have afflicted her than her child. That's how much a, a mom's love is. They would rather suffer than her children suffer. But she finds out that Jesus is in her midst. And it sounds kind of a, a parallel of another woman. She finds out that Jesus Christ is in her midst. And so, so when she comes upon Jesus, she cries out in this loud voice, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I... I'm taken aback by that because she's a Gentile. And many people of that day, even his own, the Israelites, didn't acknowledge him like this. The Bible says that he came to his own and his own rejected him. She's a Gentile. She's a Canaanite. She's a sinner. She's an unbeliever. She screams out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on you. And the Bible tells us that this is a great test. Not only a test to us, but his disciples. It says there that Jesus paid her no attention. And you would figure that if we're, if we're a, a, a muddled mass of people, and I believe he had a following there, that there was so much commotion that here is a woman that cries out, Lord, son of David. And there's so much commotion. Jesus heard her. And then, again, she's a Canaanite. So why would Jesus even pay her attention? The Bible even tells us that Jesus did not answer a word. So he totally ignored her. That's kind of rude. It's kind of like me saying, hi, Sister Angela. She just kind of walks away. Excuse me? <laughs> right? We used to say back in the 70s, she stuck up. Right? No, you're not stuck up. No. <laughs> if you think about it, Jesus paid this woman no, no mind whatsoever. But God is all knowing. And God knew that she was there. God knew her needs before it even came out of her mouth. And then, on top of that, the disciples, I find this very appealing to me. So his disciples came to him, and because, I, I, it doesn't say this here, but she's crying out. And I don't believe she just said, Lord, son of David, one time. When you're persistent, you cry out countless times. And she cried out so many times that the disciples said to him, Jesus, send her away. She's bothering us. And the thing is, is who do you think the crowd was there for? The crowd wasn't there for the disciples. The crowd was there for Jesus. I didn't hear that. The crowd was there for Jesus. Exactly. And the disciples have this pride by association. She's crying out, 
Lord, son of David. But they say, Jesus, send her away. She's crying after us. Sounds good, huh? I thought it was pretty amazing. That because of association, she's not for you, Jesus, but she's for us. The disciples have much to learn. But Jesus answers and says a few things in this dialogue that she has with her. And there's a little tip for chat here from verse 24 to verse 27. And, it, and what I mean by that is Jesus has a Jewish audience and and I'm going to talk to you about this. How in the world would Jesus respond to a person of great need which such, it sounds like such disdain or being rude. Why would he say words to a person who was in great need? And I think this was a personal challenge to his disciples and to this audience that is here today. And of course the audience that was there. That we had to learn, we had to learn with Jesus and how he would respond. And of course, we see this woman and how persistent she was, even though there was a barrier, if you will, or some type of obstacle in her path. She has great faith. And one of the things I believe, and I don't believe this is cookie cutter, I don't believe that there's just one size fits all, of how do we have great faith. One of the things is, is to recognize who he is. To recognize who God is. She said, Lord, son of David, how do you, how do you acknowledge him? That's a, to me, it's, it's a, a question that should resonate within us because when, when things are going good, and I've said this countless times, when things are going well in our lives, we can acknowledge him as God. We'll acknowledge him as Lord. But when things go awry, how do you acknowledge him? Or when God tells you to do something that is uncomfortable, to challenge you, how do you acknowledge him? Is he Lord? Is he master? Because there was a time in your lives, if you could recall this, you said, Jesus Christ, come into my life be Lord and Savior, Lord meaning master of my life. I yield my throne to you, and I now serve you. And many of us have forgot that second part. Jesus Christ is master of our lives. As our sister told us during worship, there was a time when we were shackled in sin. There was a time where we were in darkness, excuse me. There was a time where we were in the pit of hell. And Jesus freed us from that. And because he freed us from that darkness and put us into a wonderful life, we now acknowledge him as master. Because he has given us a better life. And because we have a better life, right, in Christ Jesus, he can pretty much tell us, I need you to do this. And we say, Lord, what would you have me to do? So just learn to yield to God. And the thing is, is Jesus wants us to understand this. That how we view God, or how we view the Lord, is how we will live our life. Acknowledge that. How you view God is how you will live your life. And, you know, I, I, I think of the Gospel of John. And I taught on this, that John teaches us that there are a number of I am's. That Jesus says that I am the what? The chief shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the gate. Jesus Christ tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says that I am the resurrection. How you live your life, or how you view God, is how you're going to live your life. How do you view God? How do you see God? Is God, a, is God somebody, or is he the God that when trouble comes, that he is truly Je Jehovah Shalom? That he is your peace when you need things from God? Is he Jehovah Jireh? 
When you need healing, is he Jehovah Rapha? I mean, who is God in your life? And it's, you know, to me, how we live our life. Is God Almighty God? Is he an all-knowing God? Is God ever present? How you view God is how you will live your life. And to acknowledge God in your life, no matter what the circumstance is, it makes your life, again, to live a life in Christ Jesus is to understand that I acknowledge my life in God and that no matter what takes place in my life, because God sits on my throne, I trust that God's going to guide me where I need to go, that God's going to provide for all my needs according to his riches and glory, that God is going to protect me, God is going to give me direction, God is going to give me wisdom. And, and I, I, I say this all the time when we try to acknowledge God or learn to acknowledge God in every facet, every part of our being. This is who we are as children of God. And this woman was no different. It was very simple to her life. Was she really a believer or was she just a person that had needs? All we know is this woman knew that Jesus was a healer. And that Jesus did countless healings, and she had nowhere else to turn. And she cries out, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. Amen? As I was saying, there was, there's something about acknowledging who Jesus is, and there's a great story in Matthew chapter 8. And I want to kind of point this out to you real quick, because... This is how, when we live our lives, understanding who this centurion and here was this woman, this Canaanite woman, she has no name. All we know is she's a Canaanite. But here's another person, there's no name on this individual either. He's a centurion. And the centurion has authority. He's, I would say he was like a colonel in the military. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and asked for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you to come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. Verse 9. For I myself am a man under authority, he's an officer, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, he said, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, here's the teaching, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. The centurion told Jesus. Jesus didn't tell him. The centurion told Jesus, just say the word. That's great power. That's great faith. Just say the word. That's kind of like that we actually believe. This is his view of God. That he actually believed that all Jesus had to say was the spoken word. Yes. It is through the spoken word that healing is going to take place. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to learn to embrace. We have to learn from this woman, this Canaanite woman, and we have to learn from the centurion. That is, it is through the spoken word that we believe that our problems, our healings, our circumstances will literally go away. But to have such great faith is to recognize who God is. And you know what? I, I look at that and I say, God, are these degrees of faith that I need to have? Are these degrees or measures of faith that have to be input into me? at a given time in my life. You know, these measures of faith, because of this one individual, they all recognized and acknowledged who God was. Isn't that powerful? 
to acknowledge and recognize who he is. Secondly, how do I have great faith is to be persistent in spite of the obstacles. <coughs> be persistent in spite of the obstacles. How many of you know what obstacles are, right? Yeah. Had a lot of those. In fact, uh, I've shared this countless times when I've had an opportunity to speak. Pastor Rapatis or Grandpa Rapatis taught me as a very young exhorter. He always said, where there is obstacles, there will be opportunities. And where there are opportunities, there will be obstacles. I've always lived my life by that because I know that these things will always come up. And to be persistent. And that's a hard thing to do. Because as we read this text, there's something about persistence. And here's this woman. Verse 23. Jesus did not answer a word. How many of you have prayed to God? And not prayed to God, but cried to God. Let's make that a little more urgent. We cry to God in our prayers, and we probably pray with great specifics. We didn't beat around the bush, just like this woman. She cries out to God, and she basically tells God, Lord, help me. Help me. Really specific. It's personal. And here's the obstacle. The Bible says that Jesus, or heaven, was silent. And we've all gone through that. We've had these agonizing prayers where we come and cry before God, and heaven was silent. Because I don't know about you. When I'm praying to God, you know, I, I know that we don't have a running dialogue where I'm talking to you and you're talking to me. I'm talking to you and you're talking to me, right? I say, hey, you're looking nice today. You go, oh, so are you. Right? We have a running dialogue. There's a running dialogue. But when you pray to God, we don't always have that because God doesn't speak to us in an audible voice. I can't say to God, God, heal my brother. Touch his physical body and I expect God to say, don't worry about it. It's going to be taken care of. Because all of us wish that's the way it was. But the Bible says that Jesus basically did not answer a word. He just kept walking. And of course, to be discouraged even further, in her Christ, the disciples did the same thing. They discouraged her from bothering the master. Told her to, told Jesus to send her away. Basically, hey, you're bothering the master. Oh no, you're bothering us. Not the master. You're bothering us. We are here for the children of Israel exclusively. This was an exclusive club. You think about that. Jesus is not where any Israelites are. In, in fact, he's on a region where there's more Gentiles. She's come to him for help in crying. Jesus says nothing. The disciples tell her, get away from us. We don't have the time or the minute or the day for you. She's not discouraged by any of that. And then Jesus has this this very difficult word in verse 24. Jesus answers her and says this, I was sent only to the lost of Israel. Ouch. That would be like me. And we have a multicultural church. And if my sister comes to me and said, Pastor Ben, I hear that you have the gift of healing. Will you touch me and heal me? And I go to her, no, I've come just for the Filipinos of Stockton. <laughs> she is Filipino. I'm sorry, I've come for the Filipinos of Stockton. <laughs> because I'm Filipino too. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is, Jesus, I need you. And I know that you're able to do this. 
But Jesus responds, I've come for the children of Israel exclusively. And I, I study this and I'm trying to figure out why would Jesus say such a thing? And there's something about this that I think we need to understand when Jesus is silent. Jesus knew who this woman was and he saw the audience, he saw his disciples. First he pays her no mind. He doesn't pay attention to her at all. And then he responds in kind, I have come exclusively for the children of Israel. Which must have been, for me as I read this, I go, Lord, I don't understand this, Lord. Of course, when you don't understand it, you want to study it. You want to have great understanding about what this text is all about and what is God trying to teach us. And there's something about Jesus here that he is a great master teacher. He has a great audience. In fact, like I said, he's trying to leave a legacy for his disciples. And of course, he knows the readers will be reading this forthcoming, i.e. us. And he's trying to teach us that even in these obstacles, to be persistent. People may discourage you. How many of us have ever been discouraged? You know, some of, them, some of our most difficult prayers, people come to us and in a time where it's the most darkest times, that people will say, it's over. Let it go. God can't respond in the last hour. And we hear that all the time. It's done. It's over with. God does not answer any prayers in the last hour. And that's how we can be discouraged, especially when brethren come to us or people, friends, will come up to us and tell us, it's over. Let's just let this go now. And you're a person of faith. And the thing is, is there ever a line that we put where we know that God can never do anything anymore? There's never a line. Even when it seems so impossible, where the odds are against us, when everything that we know about God, His promises, the foundation that Jesus has built on us, that Jesus Christ is the rock. And we stand on the rock. And because we stand on the rock, nothing is impossible with God. Let me say that again. Nothing is impossible with God. And it may seem like the darkest hour, but we know that God can turn around even the least of these. Where we feel that it's, there's just no way out. And with just a, a flick, it turns around. And that's how we can give glory to God. Amen? Because we don't know, but God is trying to get something out of us. God is getting us or wanting us to respond in a matter that is a godly perspective. Obstacles will come our way. And it may be the darkest time of our lives, but can we still trust God? Even though you slay me, still will I serve the Lord. Hallelujah. To the last hour. And this is what God is trying to teach us. That even though God may not speak, and even though you may be discouraged at various things, and even though you may not see the results that you are intending to have, that God is still sovereign. He's still in control. And God always has the last word. Yes. Isn't that great? Yes. And that's the trust we have in God. God always has the last word. And I love that part when we think about God. God knowing everything that we need to know about God. Obstacles sometimes are kind of scary. They're always scary. One thing I don't like when I'm driving, because I drive a lot for work, I don't like detours. <laughs> God's still dealing with me with that. I know where I need to go, and even, you know what? 
Even with Google Maps, I love Google Maps, because yellow means there's a little bit of traffic and red means it's a parking lot, right? But sometimes these high-tech toys that we have don't always tell us everything we need to know. They don't tell you that there is a detour because it just took place an hour ago. And you don't know where this detour is going to take you. And if I only would just pay attention to what I know, I would learn to take El Dorado Street because I know it goes south to north. Right? But nope, I start to lean on the technology. And all I have to do is take El Dorado Street when I'm coming south and just take it all the way and be patient because all the lights, if you drive 36 miles an hour, they're synchronized. You didn't hear that. Right? It's like March Lane. If you drive 46 miles an hour from where my house is all the way to almost, what is that? Holman. Holman Road. You can catch every light. It might as well be the freeway. Those of you that don't know that, remember, 36 miles an hour, 46 miles an hour. But the speed limit's a little slower than that, okay? They don't tell you that. And, you know, God always tells us when we're dealing with obstacles, sometimes we have to do our part. And again, we get really stubborn as people. You know, we expect God to do everything for us, and we get lazy like that. Because God is trying to teach us one thing, when he's silent, and sometimes he's expecting us to move. And James tells us this in James chapter 2, verse 18. He says, but someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, what is James saying? It's good to have faith, don't get me wrong, to have great faith. In order to have great faith, and I've... I've said this, and I don't know where I got it. Maybe I've heard it from somebody, but I've always said this. Do your part and leave the miraculous to God. You need to get out of your comfort zone when you need things of God. Do everything that you could do and leave the rest to God. And you know what? I, I love that about God. It's, it's basically saying, you're praying to God, you're saying, God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to continue. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. And I'm going to do my part. And then when I get to the edge where I know I can't do no more, then I pray more to God and say, God, take it from here. Almost being like this centurion where I'll say, God, I've done everything that I can do. And because I know you're God and I know that you're able, I know that you will take this to where it needs to be. That's great faith. Amen. So we go from persistent in spite of the obstacles, and of course, lastly, that I am not worthy. And I think this is something that I think is spread even within the body of Christ. You guys know what the word entitlement means? You know what entitlement means? There's a generation that believes they're entitled. I'm going to pick on some of you guys. I come from the old school. Old school meaning when you get a job, you get whatever education you get, you always have to start at some entry level. You could be an intern. You got to start somewhere. You don't get the corner office in the firm. When you come in, you oh yeah, I got this. My credentials, my resume is beautiful. You expect when you come into this firm to have the corner office. You have to start somewhere. But there's a generation that believes they're entitled. You know entitlement? And that's a danger because entitlement also finds itself in the body of Christ. We all feel that we're entitled to something. Well, I'm a child of the king. And because I'm a child of the king, I'm entitled to everything. David was entitled because Jesus, or God, told him he would be the king of Israel. 
But from the time he was anointed king of Israel, it took 17 years before he had actually ascended to the throne. That's a long time. There was no entitlement there. Joseph, from the time he got dreams of thinking that his family would bow down and worship him, how many years did it take from that time of the dreams to the time where he was second to Pharaoh? It took a long time. God does things in very strange ways to teach us you're not entitled to anything. We all still have to work a certain way. You don't become senior pastor of a church just because you say, Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord and Savior. You sometimes have to clean the bathrooms first and vacuum the floors. There's a process that has to take place. And, with, and going along these lines, where this woman understood that she wasn't worthy. And this is what I was trying to allude to this morning when I was saying to you, why would Jesus speak in this manner? It doesn't even make sense. Of course, earlier I told you, God knew this woman's heart. God knew that he had an audience and God knew that he had to teach. He goes on to say this and he replies to her. Here's this, this banter, this dialogue that he has with her, verse 26. He says, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The children's bread, because Jesus Christ is the bread of life. life. So, before I go any further so that we'll have a better understanding with this, Jesus, his intention was to win the lost of Israel, the children of God. If you have an argument with that, I've always asked the same thing. In fact, at our Bible study, we said the same thing. Why weren't Filipinos considered children of God? Or the Hispanics? Or the blacks? Or the Koreans? Or the Chinese? Why were they the Jews? Because he was a Jew? I don't know. That's one thing, if you ask me, I could not answer that question. God is sovereign. God has the whatever he wants to do. And we can't question why God does what he does. Because then God would say, he would say to me, where were you when I created the world? Mm -hmm. Right? And I would say, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because <laughs> God is God. And God can do whatever he wants to do. So God's this is God's master plan to win the lost of Israel, the chosen people of God, because it's a Jewish audience. And as he's trying to win the children of God, the illustration here is if you've ever broke or chopped, you know, logs, you need something called a wedge. And the wedge is used as a tool that you put on there. And as you come down with the hammer and you hit it, the wedge is a sharp blade that spreads wide, and as you get that, it splits the log in half, right? If you put the wedge backwards, right, it doesn't fulfill its task. So Jesus Christ is using the illustration in the original language. The Israelites were going to be that wedge. They were going to be the people, and they were going to be his people to win the world. They were his chosen tool to win the world. That's why it seemed exclusive. The children of Israel were God's chosen people to win the world to Jesus Christ. But we know the story about this, they rejected him. He says to this woman, he tells her, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The dogs, when we think of dogs, we always think of mutts, right? Couldn't get that out. Mutts, right? We're talking about cute puppies, okay? Cute puppies. And people in the day when they had, we weren't talking of mongrels, right? What was the name of that one that, um, animation? It was, uh, it was the two dogs. Lady and the Tramp, okay? Thank you. 
Okay. Lady and Tramp, consider these dogs that you see out on the street, right? Those are not the dogs Jesus is referring to. He's talking about puppies. They're cute puppies. Basset hounds. And all of a sudden, as the people of God in that time, as they were eating what they would eat, the crumbs would fall off the table. And the puppies were allowed or afforded to eat from the crumbs from the table. How many of you guys love dogs? You can see your hand. I know you love dogs. Okay. How many of you know that your mom or dad would tell you, never feed the dog at the table? My dog loved okra. I hated okra. And we used to wear 501 jeans and I had cuffs. And my dad would never let me leave the table till I ate my, my okra. He would boil this okra and he would cut it, slice it, so when you eat it, it's slimy. And I hated it. But my dad was so strict, he would tell me, you will eat your vegetables. Dictatorship in my house, right? So I would take the okra from my mouth and drop it in my pathway. And my dog would come around the table and I would feed it to him. And he loved okra. See? He was a Filipino dog. I thought I'd bring light to this because when we read on, verse 27, she responds, yes it is, Lord. And she's only using what Jesus already said. Because Jesus has pretty much put her in check. It is first for the people of Israel and nothing from the people of Israel should ever fall to the dogs. She said, yes it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So what do you think that means? It actually means, okay, I get it, God. The children of Israel sit at the table and you refer to me as a puppy and I know my place. The children of Israel sit at the table but the crumbs that fall from the table, that's me. I'm not saying I'm entitled to anything. I'm not here to say I'm worthy to sit at the master's table. Okay, I am what I am. I'm a sinner, I'm a Canaanite, I'm an unbeliever, and whatever falls to me, then I am entitled to God. I know my place at the table. And that's the same way we should be. We should know our place at the table. No, we're not. We weren't at that time God's chosen people. We were considered Gentiles. Many of us unbelievers, sinners, and we know our place at God's table. But the great thing about this, they may have seemed like harsh words then, but we have found out through God's grace we now sit at the master's table. You didn't hear that, church. We were once people that had to eat the crumbs because that's all we were entitled to, to eat the crumbs from the floor that dropped from the master's table. We were, as Jesus replied, puppies, dogs. That's all we were entitled to. But because of God's grace, because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary, we now are afforded to sit at the master's table. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the wonderful thing about this when we read about this. The Israelites, they may have rejected Jesus, but now we are grafted. And because we are grafted into the body of Christ, we are afforded everything that they rejected. In fact, God doesn't even call us adopted anymore. We are his children. We are afforded everything that they rejected. Every inheritance that they were supposed to have, we are given. I'm entitled to sit at my dad's table and not wait for the crumbs. And when I think about this, it is a constant reminder because this woman knew it. She didn't believe she was entitled. She, she knew exactly where her place was. But because of her belief, God told her, it will be as you requested. Your daughter will be healed. 
She had such great faith. And because of her great faith, God gave her the blessings that were bestowed upon all of us. How do we have great faith? We start out, first of all, to acknowledge God. Acknowledge God for who he is. Be persistent. Don't give up. You know, sometimes we want to give up. But be persistent even when we're discouraged, we, we, feel, we feel discouragement, when other people say things to us that may discourage us, or even if it feels like it's the last hour, be persistent and stand on God's promises. Because mm -hmm. God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask. Amen? Mm -hmm. And of course, lastly, recognize that no, I'm not worthy. And I don't believe that I'm entitled to anything that God has given me. I am given what God chooses to bless me with. Because I am a child of the King, that's why it is by grace, it is by grace that I have been saved. Amen? In the mighty name of Jesus. How do I have great faith? Those three key things. Faith comes in various measures and various degrees, but God teaches us there takes great things. It takes a certain thing to have great faith. And I really believe it's to understand, God, you're my everything. You are my I am. And because he is my I am, great faith is afforded to all of us in our time of need. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.